now and when do you when does your next semester start the fall semester yeah that's that's a good question i don't know it's supposed oh. to start in july <laughs> oh just now in 3 weeks time wow. yeah. okay ours i ours will start our semester is actually just finishing now for everybody i think Uh, and it will start in August as usual, as our usual starting time. Yeah, yeah. Too, maybe you can begin. Sure, sure. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the special functions and number theory seminar. Today we have a very special uh, speaker. I mean, who needs no introduction? Uh, Professor Rita Brata Munshi is one of the finest analytic number theorists we have. uh he uh, he has won many laurels uh, he has got the shanti swarup bhatnagar award infosys prize and many other prizes uh for his uh, excellent work uh, excellent research in number theory and uh, today he will be talking to us uh, about 100 years of sub convexity we really look forward to the talk yes. yeah thank you thank you atul for So kind words and uh, thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, the subconvexity problem, and uh, so it happens that this year is also the hundred years of subconvexity. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so it start all started in this date, uh, February tenth, nineteen twenty one. So that is the date for, for a meeting of uh, London Math Society. and uh, in that meeting there was uh, yeah you can see here a uh, researches in the theory of riemann jeta function by j e littlewood so littlewood was attending the meeting and he made some announcements there and uh, uh, and one of those among the many things that he announced uh, that day about the riemann jeta function one was about the bound about bounding riemann jeta function on the central line so he writes that in a paper written in collaboration with professor g h hardy which we hope will be published shortly it is shown that jeta half plus i t is bounded by it is t to the power 1/6 plus epsilon okay and that intermediate upper bound blah 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 that's convexity thing okay so that's uh, that's an announcement that he made exactly um, 100 years back and this is a picture of uh, hardy and littlewood so hardy on the left a little bit on the right and the bound that uh, little was little wood was claiming is this that jeta half plus it is bounded by t to the power 1/6 plus epsilon the notation here means that if you take the absolute value of jeta half plus it then there will be a constant which will depend on epsilon epsilon is up to you to choose for anything positive then a constant will exist called it c epsilon so that the absolute value of jeta half plus it is bounded by c epsilon times t to the power 1/6 plus epsilon so that um and why is that interesting okay so to understand that let's uh, go back to the definition of the riemann jeta function which i presume all of you know so it's given by a dirichlet series and also an euler product on the half plane sigma larger than 1 so sigma is the real part of the complex variable s okay and in this half plane we also have an integral representation this was already shown by uh, riemann not before him um Okay, so it's uh, integral transform of a function, so Millin transform of function psi x, where psi x looks like a theta function. Okay, and the nice thing about uh, psi x is that there is a transformation formula, which relates the value of psi at x with the value of psi at one by x. Okay, and you can use this transformation formula to relate the value of the Riemann jeta function at s with its value at one minus s. Okay, and that's called the functional equation. uh this uh, this transformation formula psi is a consequence of the poisson summation formula and so is the functional equation of the riemann jeta function okay and so here is a picture of uh, uh, of the critical is a complex plane right it's the s plane and if you look at uh, the right half plane so if you take uh, complex numbers larger with real part larger than 1 so the, on this side uh, it's given by a dirichlet series and an euler product in particular Because it's given by an absolutely converging Euler product, there are no zeros of the Riemann jeta function on this side. Okay, and uh, what uh, Riemann could prove is that uh, since it has an integral representation and which makes sense 
for all values, all complex values, except S equals to one, which is this. Uh, so you have an analytic continuation of the Riemann jitter function. And if you look at the functional equation closely, because the gamma function has poles, uh, we have some trivial zeros of the Riemann jitter function at minus two, minus four, minus six, et cetera, so at all negative even integers. Okay, so, uh, and uh, no other zeros on the, uh, on the left plane uh, sigma less than zero. And uh, so the only part that remains uh, mysterious is the critical strip, which is the uh, real num uh, complex numbers with real part between zero and one. And one has to, uh, you know, the, if you want to uh, see, uh, if you want to relate, uh, if you relate the, the analytic properties of the Riemann jeta function with prime numbers, you will see that uh, what you need to understand is the distribution of the zeros inside the critical strip. And there Riemann made his famous conjecture that all the zeros should be lying on the central line. It's called the Riemann hypothesis. Okay. Um, but the problem that we are, uh, that uh, Hardy and Littlewood were, were looking at was trying to understand the size of the jitter function inside the critical strip. Okay. And uh, you can use complex analysis and the functional equation to do that. And uh, well, one thing that you can use from complex analysis is called the fragment Lindelof convexity principle. And from that, you can derive that on the central line, line half plus it, it is bounded by t to the power one quarter plus epsilon. Okay, so again, for any epsilon, it's up to you to choose. You can choose one by trillion. And then you have a constant depending upon the trillion, says that the absolute value of jeta half plus it is less than that constant times t to the power one quarter plus one by a trillion. Okay, so that's called the convexity bound and it's quite easy because it's just a consequence of the functional equation and complex analysis. But uh, if you believe in the Riemann hypothesis, then there, that implies something much stronger, which is called the Lindelof hypothesis, which says that we will not, we should not have this extra one quarter over here. Okay, the bound will be just t to the power epsilon, where epsilon is again, any uh, positive number, however small. Okay, and uh, the subconvexity problem is uh, is about trying to improve this exponent. So try to reduce from one quarter to something smaller than one quarter. Okay, and the end we try to get to Lindelof. Right? Okay, and so the Hardy Littlewood announcement was about a subconvexity bound for the Riemann jeta function. They claim that they can prove that it's bounded by t to the power one sixth plus epsilon, and one sixth is smaller than one quarter. Okay. And, but as it turned out that Hardy and Littlewood never published their paper, okay, and it was uh, left to Landau. So I'll come back to that later. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll make just one comment that uh, the Hardy Littlewood bound is like one third way down towards the Lindelof hypothesis. Okay, so if you take, you know, from one quarter, if you have, you know, the three parts is one twelfth, one twelfth, one twelfth. So if you reduce by one twelfth, then you get one sixth. So it's one third way down towards the Lindelof. So it's in just one one slash, they reduce the um, by exponent from uh, to one third of the trivial exponent. Okay, okay so how did they prove uh, the wild bound? Or it's called the wild bound because you'll see that uh, their method crucially used uh, an an idea of Harman Wild, so it's, that's why it's called the wild bound. Okay, so uh, this is how one can prove the wild bound or the hardly little wild bound that you start with the functional equation and use Cauchy's residue theorem. Then you get an, um, you get an expression for the Riemann jeta function in the central line. It's called the approximate functional equation. It says that jeta half plus it is given by a partial Dirichlet series, okay? And uh, plus a complementary Dirichlet series, which is uh, like the Dirichlet series at half minus it, okay? So this is the partial Dirichlet series at half plus it, and this is the complementary one. Okay, and then you have to multiply uh, by a ratio of gamma factors, which is not really uh, anything of uh, concern because its absolute value is one. Okay, plus a little a small error term. And the error term is quite small because you have a t to the power one quarter in the denominator, right? So you can actually, if you are trying to bound the Riemann jeta function, you can ignore the error term. And then you'll be left with these two terms. Anyway, the jeta, this chi part here has absolute value one, so you have to evaluate or estimate this sum and this sum, okay? And if you estimate them trivially here, you will get back the convexity bound that it's bounded by t to the power one quarter plus epsilon because the length, the sum is like square root of t and you have n to the power half over here. So it gives you t to the power one quarter. 
So that gives you the convexity. And so if you want to get subconvexity, what you have to do is you have to get cancellation in this exponential sum. So by partial summation or Abel summation, you can get rid of n to the power one half. So you'll be left with n to the power. So you have this sum of n to the power i, that n is going up to square root of t, okay? And n to the power i t can also be written as this, okay? So in, this is a classic standard notation that e z is e to the power two pi i. Z, <coughs> yeah, so, uh, so these are the points on the unit circle. And as n runs over all the integers up to square root of t, this is running over the unit circle in a random fashion. And so when you add them up, you believe that there will be cancellation. Okay? And uh, if you believe in some sort of uh, complete randomness, you, uh, you think that there will be a square root cancellation here. So if you have a square root cancellation here, so if you're able to prove that it's bounded by t to the power one quarter, then you will get the uh, Lindelof uh, hypothesis. Okay? So the Lindelof hypothesis actually says that these points are really randomly distributed on the unit cycle. Okay, so this is something very standard. It's called an exponential sum. And it's a, a central thing in the analytic number theory. And there are many problems in analytic number theory where you encounter this type of uh, sums with different type of phase function, just not just t times log n, right? Okay, so, so once you reduce the problem of estimating the, uh, uh, you know, the jeta function to estimating exponential sum, then you, uh, try to use a you know, polynomial phase approximation uh, for the uh, log n phase. So here the phase was t times log n. You just replace it by a polynomial phase. Okay, and once you replace it by a polynomial phase, you just uh, use what's called the uh, wild differencing technique. Okay, okay that and uh, because of this, it's called the wild bound because that's the most crucial thing, you know, the wild differencing technique over here. And this is an example of wild, and this is all you need for, uh, you know, to get t to the power one sixth in this, uh, you know, you just need to estimate quadratic wild sum. Okay, so this is an estimate for quadratic wild sum. Okay, so that's uh, quickly how you prove uh, the wild bound of the Hardy uh, little loop wild bound for the Riemann jeta function. This is the picture of Harmon Weil, and uh, here is the, here is this uh, paper where he introduced wild differencing, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is written in German, so but yeah, and this is basically what we mean by wild differencing. It's a phase function, so he's looking at an exponential sum, he's looking at a difference, so he has a difference here, and then he's writing the difference using a Taylor expansion type of thing, and that's called uh, that's what we mean by wild differencing. Anyway, so as I said, that uh, Hardy Little would never uh, published their paper and it was left to, to Landau to publish it. And he gives credit to Hardy and Littlewood, as you can see, it's again written in German. Uh, this bound is the same bound that uh, Littlewood had claimed in his announcement. Okay, and probably Landau's technique was the same technique that Littlewood and Hardy were using in their uh, work. Okay, so now you may think that, uh, okay, so last 100 years, it's like 100 years back that announcement was made that and given the tremendous progress we have made in the last hundred years in mathematics, we should have a very strong bound. But unfortunately, the current bound record here is just t to the power one sixth by minus one by 84 plus epsilon. So this is the, the big progress that we had made in the last hundred years, a saving of one by 84. Okay, so it's like a, a saving of one by hundred. It's like in the second uh, or third decimal, uh, second decimal place saving. Okay, and this is uh, due to uh, John Burgen uh, from 2017. It's very recent and it uh, uses a lot of things, uh, including the uh, Bombay Vanage technique and the decoupling technique from the uh, from functional, uh, yeah, 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 from uh, functional analysis, free analysis. Okay, uh, so now you may say that, okay, so no one probably tried that hard to get it because it was not that interesting. Uh, it's not that true because if you look at Titchmarsh's famous book on the Riemann jeta function, you can see that uh, uh, if you look at the contents here, uh, so the bounding the Riemann jeta function and the critical strip comes as the fifth chapter, okay? And that is uh, just after he writes down the basic properties of the Riemann jeta function and he proves the prime number theorem in chapter three. 
Okay, so the first uh, non-trivial uh, thing that he does after prime number theorem in his book is trying to bound the pretty, uh, the Riemann-Jeter function in the critical strip. Okay. okay, and here is a list of improvements that uh, were made in the last hundred years. So the last one is due to Burgan, as I mentioned, 2017. And the first one uh, is the convexity bound that was proved by fragment Lindelof uh, principles due to Lindelof from 1908. And then Hardy Little Lute and Weil got 1.66666. That's right, right. And then Wallfish and uh, Titchmarsh, and then uh, many, many people worked on it in throughout the 50s and 60s. 70s, 80s, and then finally we have this one by 84 saving over the uh, while bound. Okay, so so is it still interesting? Okay, so uh, so this is another uh, reason uh, to, to look at uh, the subconvexity problem. So uh, this is a picture of Henrik Ivanich and Peter Sarnak. And uh, they had uh, written a paper called the Perspectives on the Analytical Theory of uh, L Functions on the year 2000. Uh, so it's kind of, a, they, they were given the job to list some interesting problems in analytic number theory or analytic theory of L functions. Okay, and of course, when, he, when they start listing, the first problem they listed was the grand Riemann hypothesis, right? So obviously the most important problem in analytic theory of L function. The second problem that list Problem B is the subconvexity problem. Okay, so see, they give a lot of importance to the subconvexity problem, and of course uh, there are reasons behind it. Uh, one thing is that the, the sub to other problems in analytic number theory. So one way to uh, describe it is that the techniques that you use in the subconvexity problem is uh, same as the techniques that you use in other uh, problems in analytic number theory. So it means that if we make progress in the subconvexity problem, probably the same thing that uh, will help you to make progress in other problems in adding number theory. So that's one thing. The other thing is that the subconvexity problem has some consequences in the distribution. Okay. So I will probably come back to that later. Okay, so so I already described one way of proving uh, the uh, wild bound for the Riemann jeta function, but there are many other ways. Okay, so, uh, so this is another method. So here it's called a moment technique. So here we start by computing the moment. Okay, so you take, uh, you are comp computing the two kth moment of the Riemann jeta function in the central lines, so which is an integral starting from zero, going up to high t, and jeta half plus i t to the power two k. Okay, and again, if you believe in the Lindelof hypothesis, then you expect that individually the uh, this uh, this function is bounded by t to the power epsilon. So the the moment will be bounded by t to the power one plus k epsilon. Okay, so whatever epsilon you start with, you get that. Okay, and uh, and conversely, if you can prove uh, such a bound for all all k's, all right, you, you don't really need to prove such a strong bound. If you can prove a reasonably strong bound for all k's, then you can, uh, from there, you can recover the Lindelof hypothesis. And why is that? Uh, because we have this nice relation. This is also a consequence of the uh, of complex analysis or Cauchy's theorem, that if you uh, take the uh, compute the value of the Riemann jeta function at half plus i t raised to the power two k, then it is bounded by a very short moment around that point. Okay, so here, yeah, I shouldn't have written t here. Maybe yeah, just write tau or something. So half plus i tau d tau over here, and the tau runs from t minus log t squared going up to t plus log t squared. Okay, so it's a very short moment at that near the point half plus i t, and the the value of the Riemann jeta function is bounded by that short moment, and of course this short moment is bounded by the long moment. Okay, so if you go from minus two t to two two t or something, then uh, you know so it's bounded by m k two t over here. So if you get a bound for the moment from there, you can recover a bound for the Riemann jeta function. Okay, so. So that's uh, one reason to study the moments of the Riemann jeta function. And the nice thing about moment is that there are several conjectures about this moments and, uh, you know, and you, know, you can use the random matrix theory model and get very precise asymptotic uh, about uh, uh, asymptotic you know, for the uh, moments of the Riemann jeta function. But unfortunately, this is only known for k equals to one and two and 
even for k equals to three is, uh, is wide open. Okay, uh, so yeah, so, so as I mentioned that, uh, yeah, so that as I had over here, the, uh, the jeta function raised to the power two k is bounded by this moment. So the jeta is bounded by one by two k power of the moment. And also you can you'll see here that uh, you can also write it as the moment at uh, t plus log t square minus the moment at t minus log t square, right? So this is also bounded by this. So this means that instead of uh, upper bound, if we get an asymptotic for the moment, say uh, like this, which was proved by Inham, then from this, you can get bounds for the Riemann jeta function. Right? So this is the, uh, is an asymptotic for the second moment of the Riemann jeta function. It was proved by Inham long back. Uh, okay, so it has a main term and it's the error term is of size t to the power one half, right? Okay, well, if, you, if you plug in this uh, asymptotic over here, you'll see that the main terms will cancel because you were really looking at two points which are very close to each other. So the main terms will cancel and you'll be just left with t to the power half. So that will give you, so k equals to one over here. So you'll give, get, you get jeta half plus i t square is bounded by t to the power half or jeta half plus i t is bounded by t to the power one quarter. So it will give you, so in Hans asymptotic over here gives you the convexity bound, okay? But this is not uh, the best known uh, today. So one can actually improve the error term. Uh, conjecturally, the error term will be of size t to the power one quarter, but no one has been able to prove that uh, that, but uh, yeah, so as uh, Balu proved in 1978, that this error term can be improved to t to the power one third. And if you have t to the power one third, and if you plug that in over here, you see you get the wild bound, okay? You get t to the power one sixth for the Riemann jeta function. And this can be slightly improved using the uh, techniques of uh, exponential sum, and you can get sub wild bound for the Riemann jeta function from there. Okay, so other ways to get to the wild bound is like uh, what Hit Brown did in 1978. So he computed a 12th moment, okay? And his uh, bound, he, he didn't uh, prove the Lindelof on average, okay? But uh, he proved a bound which is of uh, size t square, but he, the, he is computing the 12th moment. So it's a very high moment. So from there, he could also recover the uh, wild bound for the Riemann jeta function, right? And if you plug this in over here, over here, in fact, you'll see get, you get to the power one, one, one sixth for the Riemann jeta function. Okay, and, and there's another way is uh, computing a uh, short moment as was done by uh, Ivanich in uh, 1979. Okay, so this is uh, related to what's called an amplification technique, okay? So instead of uh, computing the full moment from zero to T, so you take a short moment from T to T to the power, T plus T to the power two third, and computing the fourth moment, you could prove uh, this bound to the power two third over here, which is like the Lindelof on average, because if you expect the Riemann jeta functions are bounded by one, then since the length of the integral c to the power two third, this is the best you can get. So he proved the Lindelof on average, but it's a very short uh, interval. So uh, from here, if you, uh, you, know, you get t to the power one sixth, so you again get the wild bound. So you can see that the wild bound is uh, something kind of universal. So you whatever techniques you have, you ultimately end up getting the wild bound, you know, whether you compute the 12th moment or you compute the second moment or you compute, uh, you know, short moment, you are ending up with the wild bound. If you want to go beyond the wild bound, which is still possible for the Riemann jeta function, you have to get an improvement in, uh, in the exponential sum, okay? So you have to get improved estimate for the exponential sum, uh, which is possible using uh, what's called van der Korput technique or, you know, point, uh, you know, uh, exponent pairs, things like that. Okay, so here is one challenging problem that you can try. So it's computing the sixth moment of the Riemann jeta function is still wide open, and we don't even know today whether uh, the Lindelof uh, on average is true for the sixth moment. So this even this bound is not known. So if you prove this bound, you get the wild bound for the Riemann jeta function, uh, but uh, this is not known. Okay, so now uh, let me introduce some other examples of uh, L function. Uh, so this is a Dirichlet, uh, I'll introduce the Dirichlet L function first. Okay, so as I said, the Riemann jeta function is just like a prototype, okay? So it's a, 
it's like the tip of an iceberg. So, uh, so another uh, L function which is related to the, which al almost looks like a Riemann jeta function is called the Dirichlet L function. This was introduced by Dirichlet before Riemann um, to uh, study uh, primes in arithmetic progression. He used this to prove infinitude of primes in arithmetic progression. Okay, so you take a primitive character chi uh, uh, for the group Z modulo MZ star, so you can, so it's primitive means it's not coming from a smaller uh, modulus. So M here is the modulus. And we define the Dirichlet function by this uh, Dirichlet series, chi n by n to the power s. It's also given by this Euler product. This equality is just the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that every integer can be uniquely written as prime products of primes, uh, right? And, uh, and again, because chi n's are bounded, so they're all landing on the unit circle, uh, you can show that they are this series and also the Wheeler product, they're absolutely converging in the half plane sigma larger than one as the Riemann jeta function. And uh, also there is an integral representation which can be used to prove a functional equation for this L, L function. So you can prove that there is a relation between uh, the L function, the value of the L function at S with the value of at one minus S for not LS chi, but for LS chi bar. Chi bar is the conjugate uh, character, okay? And again here, uh, if you look at this local factors, this almost looks like this is just a linear polynomial in one by p to the power s, okay? So in the case of Riemann jeta function, we had one by p to the power s. Here, here we are just twisting by chi p, okay? But nevertheless, there is uh, the, it's only linear in one by p to the power s. It's a degree one. And so the Dirichlet L function, like the Riemann jeta function, is an example of a degree one L function. Okay. All right, uh, so again, uh, for the Dirichlet L function, we expect the Riemann hypothesis, which will again uh, imply the Lindelof hypothesis, which will mean, now in case of Dirichlet L function, there are two parameters that you can play with. So one is the T, that's the point where you are computing the Dirichlet L function, at half plus IT, so it's up there on the central line. The other thing that you can play with is the modulus of the character M, okay? So there are two aspects. One is called the T aspect and there's the level aspect. And both of them contribute to the complexity of the L function, okay? And the Lindelof hypothesis, uh, uh, you know, it, it predicts that the, the value of the L function cannot be too large. So it's bounded by T times M to the power epsilon for any epsilon. But again, the fragment Lindelof Convexity principle only gives you the exponent one quarter plus epsilon. So the convex it's a convexity problem here is again to reduce from one quarter to something smaller than one quarter. And again, there are now there are two two things that you can do. You can try to keep m fixed if you don't uh, uh, care much about the character. So the character is fixed, but you are playing around with the height of the function. You are going on the central line. You are going towards infinity, right? So in the t part, then you want to bit the t to the power one quarter, but uh, this is just like uh, the Riemann jeta function if you pick the, keep the character fixed. Or you can keep the uh, point t fixed and vary the character, right? And uh, take uh, the modulus larger and larger. And uh, that, that's a different aspect. That's called the level aspect. It's something more arithmetic than the, the t aspect. Okay, and uh, one way to attack uh, this uh, subconvexity problem here is again, Using the functional equation, you get the approximate functional equation, which gives you a way to write down the L value on, this, on the central line. Okay, it's again given by partial Dirichlet series uh, at it and the conjugate at minus it. Okay, with multiplied by an epsilon factor over here, which is again of absolute value one. So if you want to estimate this, you have to estimate this sum and they have to estimate this sum and they are conjugate to each other. So basically you have to just estimate one of these two sums. And uh, so roughly speaking, you'll see that, uh, you know, uh, to compute this L function, you have to make like square root of MT mini computation. So, uh, so MT, we'll call this M times T with the conductor of the L function. So it's kind of measuring the complexity, okay? So that means if you want to compute something on the, uh, on the central line, you need to do square root of the conductor mini computations. And the convexity bound in that case will turn out to be the conductor to the power one quarter, okay? Okay, so as I said that when you look at Dirichlet function in the T aspect, it's same as the Riemann jeta function, there's nothing new. 
But if you forget the T and if you look at the modulus, then it's a more arithmetic problem and it's uh, much more difficult to prove a subconvex bound in that case. That was done in 1960s uh, by Burgess and he proved that it's bounded by three to m to the power 316 plus epsilon. Okay. So 316 is smaller than one quarter, which is 416. Okay, so he again used the wild technique with some ingenious uh, factorization uh, uh, you know, uh, trick. Plus uh, he used what's called the way, um, it's the uh, Riemann hypothesis for uh, curves on uh, over function function sets. Okay, so um, so using these two, while and where, he could prove m to the power three by sixteen. And uh, a little later in 1978, and another paper in 1980, his Brown combined the technique of um, uh, Hardy, Little Lud, and while with the technique of Burgess, and he could establish. Uh, MT to the power 316 plus epsilon. So it's jointly, it's a subconvex bound jointly in the T aspect as well as the uh, chi in the M aspect. Okay, and very recently, uh, this Barge's bound uh, was uh, was a record for a long time from until 2019, for like 60 years, it was the record. No one could able to prove and improve this three by 16. While, you know, I just mentioned the wild bound was improved in the last hundred years several times. Okay, and very recently it was improved by Petro and Young uh, using a different technique and they, they could prove uh, that m to the power one six plus epsilon. Okay, so this is just the wild bound. So they, so if you look at the Barges bound, you'll see that it's, a, uh, so the wild bound is one third way down towards Lindelof and the Barges bound is one quarter way down towards Lindelof. So instead of one quarter way down towards the lots, they have one third way down to the lots. So it's a big improvement. Okay, so now let me uh, introduce some um, higher rank L functions. Okay, so so far we have been just looking at uh, degree one L functions. Okay, so as I said, that this talk is about uh, the history of subconvexity. So I'm not really going to the detail uh, definition of uh, mass forms or modular forms or Automorphic forms. So I'll slowly introduce these objects one by one, uh, and I'll try to uh, say something about what's known about the subconvexity problem uh, for such uh, for the, the corresponding L functions. Okay. So the the discriminant modular form is an, an example of what's called a, a cast form for S L to Z. Okay. So here uh, I'm writing Q to be easy. Okay, z to the power two pi i z. So z is taken to be a number on the upper half plane. Okay, then I look at this product. Okay, so it's the uh, it's the power of the uh, Dedekin eta function, right? So this was started by Ramanujan, and it's related to the discriminant of uh, of elliptic curves. So it's called the discriminant form. So Ramanujan was interested in the expand Q expansion of delta z and once you do the expansion, you get some interesting numbers, which he denoted by tau n, and he wrote down several conjectures about this numbers tau n, right? Okay, the nice thing about this uh, function delta z as a function on the upper half plane is that it satisfies a transformation uh, formula with respect to all matrices in SL to z. Okay, so it's not just one transformation formula, it's a bunch of transformation formula. Actually, it's a is uh, generated by two. Uh, one is a translation, the other is an inversion. Okay, so because SL to Z is generated by two elements. So you have a bunch of transformation formulas for delta Z, so which can be used. Okay, and in general, so this, these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, so delta is a cast form for the full modular group SL to Z. In general, what you do is you try to uh, study forms of this type with respect to congruence subgroups, gamma not n. So gamma not n consists of matrices A, B, C, D, where C is divisible by capital N. Okay, so it's of level N congruence subgroups. So uh, so if you're given a gamma not n and the character psi, initially character modular n, then we define a space called the space of modular forms with weight k, level n, and even type of psi, uh, which consists of polymorphic form, polymorphic functions on upper half plane satisfying transformation formulas of this type twisted by this Niven tipus over here. And uh, we also put an uh, extra condition about how it should behave at the cusp. Like there should be a cusp at infinity and there may be a cusp at other points on the real line. Okay. 
Okay, so that uh, together gives you a definition of uh, a modular form for any congruence group. Right? And of course, delta is a prototype for such a uh, form. Okay, so, uh, so as I said, the delta is uh, for full level. So here, capital N is just one. Okay, and if you, uh, if you are given a delta and if you are given a Dirichlet character, say of uh, uh, modulus capital M, primitive Dirichlet character modulus M, then I can twist delta by chi. Uh, you know, you use this uh, expansion. So instead of tau n q to the power n, you write tau n chi n q to the power n. And that turns out to be a modular form satisfying these properties. So it's actually a modular form of the same weight as uh, the delta 12, but the level is no more one. The level is m square, where m is the uh, modulus of chi, and the niven tipus is chi square. Okay, so from delta and uh, Dirichlet character, you can uh, you can generate other modular forms, not just of level one, but higher levels. Okay, so as I said, the Ramanujan made uh, uh, fantastic uh, predictions about this uh, uh, coefficients tau n. So first he uh, predicted that there, there are some multiplicativity properties. So it's uh, multiplicative in that sense, if you have co-prime m and n. And also it, uh, for prime powers, it will satisfy a recursion relation like of degree two. And finally, he also predicted that for a prime, the tau p is bounded by two times p to power 11 by two absolute value. Okay, so these are called the Ramanujan conjectures. The first two conjectures were proved by a model uh, just the, the year, one year after Ramanujan made those conjecture. But the last one uh, remained open for a long time. It was proved in 1973, I think, by Deline, using techniques from algebraic geometry. Yeah, so once we have a modular form like the discriminant form, we want to define an L function and that was done by Hecke. So this is a picture of Hecke. Uh, so as, uh, as Ramanujan predicted and as proved by Delin later, the tau n's are of the size n to the power 11 by two. So we divide tau n by n to the power 11 by two. So it's normalized. So it's roughly now of size n to the power epsilon. It's actually bounded by the uh, divisor function. Let's call that tau not n. So these are the normalized uh, coefficients for uh, the discriminant form. And then we look at the Dirichlet series. And if you go back to the first two predictions of uh, Ramanujan, that actually implies that this Dirichlet series is given by this Euler product. But now interesting thing about the Euler product you'll see is that it's no more a linear, fun a linear poly polynomial in one by p to the power s. It's a quadratic polynomial in one by p. So it's an example of a degree two L function. Okay? And you cannot really factorize it. Uh, you know, can actually write it as a Dirichlet a Euler product of degree one. Okay. But uh, this, uh, this uh, L function on the L series that uh, was associated to delta also has an integral representation. You can write it as a Mellin transform of delta I Y. So, okay. So like, the Riemann zeta function had an integral representation in terms of uh, theta function. And there also we use the transformation property of the theta function to get a functional equation. Here, here you can use the transformation property of delta to get a functional equation for this completed L function. You can show that lambda is delta is same as lambda one minus is delta, okay? And in general, for general uh, more, more cost forms, we have a functional equation of this type Okay, so now uh, you have to multiply by a gamma factor and a suitable power of n, where n is the the uh, the, congruence, the level of the congruence group associated with f. Okay, and then also we have a root number, which is i to the power k. Okay, so this is an example of a degree two L function. This is associated with modular form. Okay, and now uh, so again we can use this functional equation to get, write down an expression for the central, uh, for the uh, L values on the central line. And uh, again, so there is a notion of conductor. The conductor in this case is given by this. So it's uh, the level of the, of the congruence group times K plus T square. So if you were looking at Delta, then N is one and uh, the K is just uh, 12. So it's basically T square, okay. And, uh, and the convexity bound is again, just one quarter of this conductor. So this L half plus I T F will be bounded by one quarter of the conductor. And now there, there you see there are three different 
components which uh, go into this uh, conductor. One is the, the, so the T is already present, the T aspect. And now there is a spectral parameter K, which is the width, and then also the level is N. Okay, so there are three different, uh, three different flavors that uh, go into this bound. Okay. Okay, so people started looking at the subconvexity problem for a degree two L function um, in starting in 1980s, and uh, Anton Good was the first person to give a subconvex bound. So he proved the wild bound for this L function. So uh, his method is based on moment. So he computed uh, the second moment for uh, this and modular L functions. And uh, he wrote down an asymptotic for that with a nice error term, just did it for two third. Uh, okay, so it's like uh, what uh, Balu had for the Riemann jeta function. Okay, and if you use that uh, same techniques that I described, uh, you will see that this having a bound of this type for the error term gives this bound to the power one third. Okay, and uh, this L function can be related with the square of the Riemann jeta function because this is like a degree two L function. So if you have a t to the power one third bound for this uh, and uh, for the jeta square, then for jeta it's t to the power one six. So this bound of one third for this function is actually uh, is corresponding to t to the power one six for the Riemann jeta function. So it's actually an analog of the while bound in this uh, context. Okay, so a good technique was uh, he used the spectral theory of Laplacian on the upper half plane, and he used that uh, to estimate uh, this. Uh, uh, in shifted convolution sum problem, okay. And uh, later, Utila used uh, um, uh, a software trait technique, which was based on Voronoi summation formula, and he could prove the same wild bound for uh, the L function. Okay, till now the wild bound remains uh, the uh, the record in this case. Okay. Okay, so this is a picture of uh, Ivanich and Friedlander, and they together introduced uh, the amplification technique, which uh, resulted in the, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, you know, subconvex bounds in the case of degree two functions, as we'll see. Okay, so let me briefly tell you what the amplification technique is. So these things were introduced around 1990s. Okay, uh, so in the usual moment method, uh, this is what you do. So suppose you want uh, to get a subconvex bound for L half pi naught, okay? So what you do is you start to get, try to get a family of forms, such that pi naught is a part of that family, okay? And then you try to estimate the second moment over the family, okay? And since uh, all these numbers are non-negative and pi naught belongs to them, or pi naught belongs to, uh, is in the family, so it is one, one of these factors here, so if you have a bound for this moment, you can recover a bound for the individual, okay? And so uh, now the best bound that you can expect to get from here, because these are like on average like one, that's what predicted by Lindelof, is that the moment is of roughly of size, same size as the family, okay? And so if you want to get uh, subconvexity, so you need the family to be quite small. It has to be smaller than uh, square root of the, uh, of the conductor of the the of the uh, of the pi naught that you start with. Okay, so this is the conductor q pi naught. Okay. On the other hand, and the problem is you cannot take re, uh, f to be really small because uh, your technique will be based on uh, you know opening this absolute value and try to do a sum over pi, sum over the family, and uh, you will be uh, you want something like completeness, okay, you have a complete, you need, you need a, some, some sort of a complete orthogonality in the family. So the family cannot be too small. If it's too small, then you will not uh, gain anything by averaging. On the other hand, if it's too big, then the contribution of the individual uh, L half pi naught will be too small in there, so that you will not get a good bound for the individual value. Okay, so that's the moment method. So what uh, Ivanich and Friedlander observed was that uh, that in many cases, it turns out, in the case of GL2L function, that you end up with a natural family, which is exactly the size of the square root of the conductor. Okay, and as I mentioned here, that in that case, you cannot use a moment because you'll be just stuck with convexity. So they introduced an extra wing over here, so which is called an amplifier. And this amplifier will have the property that uh, it will give you give more weight 
to that particular pi naught that you want to estimate, and it will be uh, uh, less on average for the other pi's. Okay, so that's the amplification technique. Of course, the main problem there now is how to come up with an amplifier, and that's a very arithmetic uh, problem. Okay, so here is an example of how the amplifier is used, and this is how they use the amplifier for the first time for the degree two L function. So you start with the cusp form and the character, and you want to, uh, so you, uh, we look at the twisted form, as I mentioned, it's of uh, level M squared, even to plus naught squared. The convexity bound is one quarter of the level, so it's M to the power half. You want to get something better. Okay, now a natural family uh, where you can put this L value into is to look at L half F twisted by chi, where chi runs over all uh, characters modulo M. Okay, so now there will be like M many characters modulo M. So it's a natural family, but the size of the family is like square root of the size of the conductance M squared. So it's uh, not good for moment. So Duke Friedland and Evan H computed the second uh, amplifier moment. Okay, so the amplifier here is quite easy because you want to amplify the contribution of, uh, of, the, of the factor with chi is, uh, is chi naught. So you just, uh, you know, you define a chi to be this. So when chi equals to chi naught, this, all of them are just one, and so it's subsize L. When chi is not equal to chi naught, then we expect that there will be cancellation because it's not really one, okay? And so this is an uh, easy amplifier in this case, and they use that to prove this subconvex bound. So m to the power half is the convexity, and then the one by 22 seven. And this had a nice uh, application. All right, uh, so this, uh, this is, Examples of subconvex uh, bound proved uh, using the amplification technique. So there was a series of paper by Duke Friedland and Ivanich, which ultimately resulted in the level aspect and spectral aspect subconvexity for degree two L function. And Sarnak and Lau Liu Yi used this to give weight aspect or spectral aspect subconvexity for the Rankin-Silberg GL2 plus GL2 Rankin-Silberg function. And in a series of paper, uh, Philip Michel with collaborators Kolsky, Vanderkam, and Harkos, uh, proved level aspects of complexity for uh, GL2 plus GL2 ranking silver L functions. Okay, so what about higher degree L functions? Okay, so there are ways to um, uh, get higher degree L functions starting with uh, the discriminant form. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to the definition of automorphic forms. Uh, so suppose, uh, so, so yeah, so recall that L is delta is given by a Euler product of degree two. We can factorize it and write it as a, uh, so alpha one and beta one are the, are the uh, roots of the local polynomial. Okay. And so one way uh, we saw how we can generate new L function is just by twisting by a Dirichlet character, which at the local level is just like twisting these local roots by chi p. Another way to generate a different L function is look at the symmetric square. Okay, so where it is a degree three L function, where the local factors are the symmetric polynomials of alpha and beta. So it's alpha square, alpha times beta and beta square. Okay. And uh, so if you look at this Dirichlet, the uh, Euler product is also can be written as a Dirichlet L function. And Shimoda proved that it has all the nice analytic properties like the riemann jeter function. Okay, so another way is, uh, as I mentioned that GL2 cross GL2 rank in some contribution. So you have to have a delta and an F, suppose the local factors for F, sorry, I shouldn't have a chi P over here, is alpha two and beta two are the local factors, forget the chi P's, okay? And then uh, the rank in silver convolution will have uh, this as a local factor. So it will have, also you can do a GL3 cross GL2 rank in silver convolution. So this, uh, this uh, GL2 cross GL2 is the degree four L function and you can prove standard uh, analytic properties for that. And this is a way to construct a GL3 cross GL2 ranking silver. So it's a symmetric square was the GL3. And now we take another GL2. Okay. It's a it's a degree six with a product. So it corresponds to a, a, de, a degree six uh, L function. Okay. Uh, okay, so as I said, so suppose we just focus on the T aspect, right? So for the symmetric square, it's a degree three, so the conductor becomes T cube and T to the power three fourth is the convexity. Okay, and a delta cross F is a degree four, so T to the power four is the convexity, and T to the power four is the conductor, T is the convexity bound. 
And this is a t to the power six is a conductor and t to the power three by two is a convexity bound. And of course, in all these cases, we, uh, we expect the uh, Riemann hypothesis to be true and that will imply that the bound will be t to the power epsilon in all these cases. Okay, so again, uh, to attach this problem, we can use the approximate functional equation, which is a consequence of functional equation. And it will give an expression for this L values in terms of partial sums. Okay, and uh, here a and ones are the Fourier coefficient of symmetric square L function, which is the GL3 uh, automorphic form. Basically, they just look like this. A and one is tau naught M square, where M L square equals to N. Okay, so it's basically, if you, if you want to, uh, you know, if you don't want to go into GL3, think of it as tau naught N square into the power IT. Okay? And here it's tau naught N squared lambda N into the power IT. Okay, so all these L functions, uh, since they satisfy all the standard conditions, they are expected to be automorphic. That's a prediction due to Langlands. It's a picture of Langlands. And uh, in these cases, we know that they are automorphic. Okay, so the past, for symmetric squares, it's due to Gilbert and Jacquet. For delta cross F, it's due to Dinakar Ramkrishnan. And symmetric square cross F, it's uh, due to Kim and Shahidi. So the symmetric square corresponds to an automorphic form for GL3. Symmetric square cross F corresponds to an automorphic form on, on GL6. Okay, and again, in this case, in all, in all this, uh, you know, if you look at the L functions corresponding to automorphic forms, you again expect a uh, Riemann hypothesis to be true for all of them. So that predicts that the, all the non-trivial zeros are on, on the central line. And the Riemann hypothesis will imply the Lindelof hypothesis, which will say that the L values are bounded by the conductor to the power epsilon. Okay, And in this cases, the conductors are given by some integer, which is like the level times uh, the T and the spectral parameters are involved. So there are three different type of things that go into this definition of conductor. One is this integer Q pi, which is called the level of the form. And then you'll see that there, if you forget about the spectral parameter, there are like D many T's. So T to the power D is a T aspect part, okay? And if you forget the Q pi and T and you are interested in the spectral parameters, then mu i is uh, this, uh, contributing for every I one to D. So the spectral, uh, you know, so the, the conductor has three different components. The level component is Q pi, the T component is T to the power D, and the spectral component is, okay? So D is the, D is the degree of the L function here. Okay, and uh, so the subconvexity problem is try to improve this one quarter. Okay, so you can do it either in the level aspect or in the T aspect or in the spectral aspect. So there are three different aspects you can look at, or you can combine them and try to get subconvexity in the T aspect and level aspect or level aspect and spectral aspect together, things like that. And uh, these are the standard methods. I already mentioned the moment method and the amplification technique. The other three methods that uh, are used is, uh, one is due to Conrad and Ivanich. So it's a combination of the moment method and, and then uh, the fact that certain L values are non-negative. So okay, so it's a moment method plus positivity, which plays an important role in Conrad Ivanich method. There is a period method approach. This is due to Bronstein Reznikov and also due to Michel Venkatesh. And then there is a delta method approach. Okay, so these are the highlights of the period approach. So back in 2010, uh, Bronstein Reznikov, they looked at triple product L functions. So it's a GL2 plus GL2 plus GL2. There are three GL2 forms. Two of them are fixed. So pi two and pi three are fixed and you're varying the spectral parameter of pi one and they had a, so lambda one, lambda one is the spectral parameter, lambda one or lambda minus lambda one is the spectral parameter of pi one. Lambda one squared is the convexity. They had a one third improvement over there. Venkatesh uh, looked at the same problem, but he was interested in the level aspect. So pi one has level P one, pi two and pi three are fixed. P one to the power one is the convexity. He had a saving of one thirteenth over one. And Michel Venkatesh in their important paper they proved uh, subconvexity for the GL2 L function, uh, GL2 plus GL2 L function for any automorphic form over any number field. So it's a very general result, uh, not just over a Q or anything. And recently uh, this year, uh, uh, Blomore, uh, Jana and Nelson have used the same technique to prove the wild bound for the triple product. So in, there, in this setup, 
where instead of just one third saving, they have a while bound. Okay, so it's like one third down uh, towards lim log from lambda one square. Okay, okay so our highlights of Conroy Vanage approach is that first Shouching in 2011 used this to prove the T aspects of convexity for symmetric square L function. It's a big jump ahead at that time. So three, three quarters is the convexity she had a saving of one sixteenth. Okay. And uh, recently, uh, Petra and Young, as I mentioned, they improved on the barges bound and they use the same Connery vanish technique in there um, with a lots of uh, innovative inputs there. Okay, okay so uh, in the last, I don't know, yeah, five minutes, I, I can say something about the Delta method. So it's something I introduced in this uh, setup. Okay, so first uh, I proved the T aspects of convexity for a general GL3 automorphic form pi. It's no more a symmetric square. The symmetric square L functions are self dual. Here pi may not be self dual. So I had the same bound as uh, Shaoqing had, but of course my approach is not the same. She could uh, do it here. She could use quantity advantage because in her case, uh, the central values are known to be non negative. Okay, so that's uh, the special thing for the uh, self dual forms or symmetric square L functions. For general GL3 form, it's not there, but still you can use the delta symbol approach and get the same bound. This exponent has been improved and the current record is three by 40. We expect to improve it to three, one by eight. Should be coming up soon. And uh, using delta method, I also did the same thing for the T aspect for the GL3 cross GL2. So I had a three by two minus one by 51. Okay, so three by two is the convexity here. So it's an example of a degree six L function. And uh, you can use this uh, uh, also to do for GL2 cross GL2, uh, not for GL2, uh, yeah, for GL2 cross GL2 cross GL2, you still don't have any delta method approach for that, okay? And if you're interested in other uh, aspects, uh, the Shumit, my students Shumit and Prolad, they worked out some, uh, uh, you know, Shumit worked out the spectral aspect. So in his case, the GL3 part is fixed and GL2 is varying and uh, he gets a saving there. And Sharma, uh, he twists it by a Dirichlet character, so pi is a GL3, F a GL2, and he gets an improvement over the convexity. And uh, both are like uh, a good improvement, not just a trivial improvement. Okay. And uh, also I mentioned a paper by Kumar, Malaysian and Singh, and they get a, uh, in, this is not just for the non-generic case, it's not a, for generic L function, so look at GL3 plus GL2, but the GL2 is fixed, but the GL3 is varying in spectrum. And they have a subconvex for that. Okay, all these three are based on delta symbol approach. Okay, so I don't have time to give you the details of the proof, but uh, this is how these things uh, work. You know, you start with, uh, so if you can recall that if you want to get a bound for the central value for GL3 plus GL2 L function, then you need to get a bound for things like this, okay? In the, we use the delta method or use the circle method to separate the oscillation of the GL3 Fourier coefficient from the GL2 Fourier coefficient. That's what, that's the first step. Okay, and then you use a Voronoi summation formula to deal with the GL3 and with, also with the GL2. Okay, and then, uh, you know, you evaluate the character sum here and that turns out to be just a additive character. The next step is applying Cauchy to get rid of the GL3 Fourier coefficient. And then again, open the absolute value square, apply Poisson. And if you work it out completely, you'll see that you'll have a saving of T to the power three by two extra over the loss of N that you had in the first step, okay? And that gives you uh, this bound. Uh, so my paper uh, just gives you a, a one by 51 saving, but this is the limit of the method that you can expect to prove. So this is briefly the sketch of the steps that go into the delta symbol approach for subconvexity. Okay, and now why do we care about subconvexity? Uh, okay, so this is a cartoon strip from Mo Williams. Uh, so here, Gerald says that then I had an idea. I wanted to lift Hippo onto my trunk, and uh, Piggy asked why he wanted to do that. And Gerald thinks about it and uh, says the answer is because. And uh, Piggy seems to be happy with that answer. So yeah, so if you are doing some convexity, you should be just happy that you were able to do 
uh, able to prove subconvex bound for uh, health functions. But nevertheless, there are applications of subconvexity to other things in number theory. And, uh, and one was given by Landau. So he showed that if you have an improvement uh, for bounds for the Riemann jeta function, then you can get an improved bound for the difference of two consecutive primes. Okay. Uh, you can use uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Duke Flindander Ivanich for the twisted L function to show equidistribution of rational points and spheres or ellipsoids. And you can use the work of uh, Philippe Michel on rankin silver uh, uh, convolution, GL2 plus GL2 rankin silver convolution to show equidistribution of Higner points on the upper half plane. And if you're lucky at one day, if we can able to prove subconvexity for symmetric square L function in the weight aspect or level aspect, we'll be having a consequence in quantum chaos or quantum unical organicity. So there, there are fantastic applications of uh, subconvexity in other branches in number theory or beyond and even in physics. Okay, and with that, I'll stop. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Munshi, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, uh, Professor Bal. No, no, I have no questions. It was fantastic. Okay. Just for this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, uh, okay. I have yeah. one so now we can call the Delta method the Indian variant. <laughs> Yeah. I, I hope there will be no objection calling it Indian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? In the Delta method is also sort of the circle method of Ramanujan. Therefore, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, if there are no uh, questions, uh, let's uh, thank Professor Munshi again. Uh, we can unmute uh, and then clap. Okay. Christian wants to say something. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. No, no, just a question about the Voronoi summation that you last briefly mentioned. So the one for GL2 was known probably, but what about the one for GL3? You de developed one uh, of no, your own. That's due to, uh, first due to Miller and Schmidt, and then uh, uh, Goldfeld and uh, Shouching Lee. You, you were able to use that? Yeah, in its direct form. Right. It's more or less explicit. Apart from the integral transform where you need to do a little bit, but otherwise it's kind of explicit. So the delta symbol method, uh, as Professor Balu was saying, it's uh, based on, it's related to the circle method. So if you could yeah, say yeah. a couple of words. Yeah, it's, it's actually a circle method approach, but uh, you know the delta method is an offshoot of that. It's, yeah. So instead of, uh, you know, that the circle method is about integrating with the circle or you just use the harmonics for the circle group, right? And uh, and the delta method of DFI or Duke field and advantage is uh, they detect uh, this, uh, uh, whether an integer is zero or not by the fact that the zero, uh, every number divides zero. So that's the fact that you use to detect whether an integer is zero or not. So it's slightly different from integrating over a circle. Yeah, and then uh, of course you can use harmonics from other Lie groups to uh, get expansion of the delta symbol. But so far we haven't been able to really get a very interesting application of that. You know, whatever I had, I used some GL2 harmonics, but uh, whatever I had there, I could also prove it using GL1 harmonics later. So, <laughs> so still I'm waiting for something which where you can only use GL2 harmonics and nothing else. <laughs> I'm sure you'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Professor Munshi again. Bye.